Hello and welcome back. In our final lesson on social psychology, we're going to be looking at the more positive aspect of society in love and helping. So we're going to be taking a look at all of the different reasons why people help each other and what leads to those close relationships with those that we love. So let's start today by talking about why do we help? Why do we see people helping other people in our society? One of the reasons could be due to what is known as altruism. And altruism is doing something for another person with absolutely no expectation of getting anything in return. It is the most unselfish regard for the welfare of others. So purely helping someone out of the goodness of their own heart. Now, some people argue that pure altruism does not entirely exist because you always get something out of helping, even that good feeling that you get when you help others. And if we get something out of a helping exchange, that could either be the reciprocity norm or the social exchange theory. Now the social exchange theory essentially says that the reason we help others is because it's mutually beneficial to both parties. So the person we're helping get something out of it and we get something out of it as well. It's how two parties might maximize their profits and minimize their costs. So think about how we might help somebody else. Not that we would ever do this, but let's say for example, it would be something like dividing up homework and then copying off each other. You do half the problems, I do half the problems, and then we share our answers with each other later. The way that this fits into social exchange theory is that we're minimizing our costs because it's taking us half the time to do the homework and maximizing the benefits because we both get the entire homework set done. So that is a way that we help others that's also helping ourselves. Another way we get something out of helping others is what's known as the reciprocity norm. And this is more about the idea of calling in a favor. So the reciprocity norm might start with lending a hand to somebody else and then asking for a favor down the road. That person is going to feel more obligated to return the favor because you helped them the first time around. So that could be something like helping somebody move and then six months or a year later, asking that same person to return the favor and help you move when it's time for you. Or it could be, helping someone study for a calculus test, and then later asking that person to help you with French. This is different than social exchange theory because we're not minimizing our costs in any way. It's more about the obligation that we feel towards others to help them if they have helped us. Another reason we might help others is due to social responsibility. That sense of, again, obligation that we have to help certain groups of people. We're not looking for anything in return here, but we're not just doing it out of the goodness of our hearts either. Social responsibility really taps into societal norms or expectations that we have to help those who are dependent on others. That could be something like helping children or the elderly, those who are sick or in need in some way, the obligation that we feel as a society, as a whole, to help those. It might be why we do something like bring in canned food for a food drive, for example. And a byproduct or a benefit of helping could lead to superordinate goals. And this is when people set aside their differences in order to work towards a common goal or work to help other people. This could be something like politicians on both sides of the aisle setting aside their differences to come together to help pass a bill for relief for a hurricane or a tornado or some other type of natural disaster, helping others that requires us to set aside our differences in order to work towards that same goal. There are other concepts we can look at as well to look at how groups work together to help each other and sometimes how we don't. One way we might work together to help each other is through a concept known as GRIT that stands for gradual reduction in tension. This is something that we might see again in politics as a way to de-escalate conflict between two parties. The idea is when two groups are at each other's throats to prevent 
conflict from escalating even further, each group offers up small concessions, something very tiny that they can give the other group that will allow the other side to back off as well. And continuing this process over and over again of small compromises or concessions that each group will make in order to reduce tension and de-escalate any conflict that might arise. But what prevents us from helping other people as well? One thing could be what's known as a social trap. And this is essentially looking at immediate versus long-term rewards. And sometimes we refuse to do something that will help others because the immediate payoff seems greater to us than say a long-term payoff. An example of this could be those share a ride programs that some cities try to implement to try and reduce traffic congestion. When people drive together, there's less cars on the road, which lead to less traffic, which means people will get to their destinations faster. The problem with this social trap is that many people find it's inconvenient. They believe it would be faster for them to go at their own time to run their errands and accomplish their goals until they decide to take their own car instead of using the share ride program. This will add more cars onto the road, increasing the traffic congestion and making it take longer for them to get done whatever they need to do, which is what creates the problem that they were trying to solve in the first place. Another concept that contributes to why people don't always help others is a very famous concept known as the prisoner's dilemma. This is a paradox in decision making where a person has to weigh their own self-interests with the group outcome. And when you don't know what the other person is going to do, we're often left to looking out for our own self-interests, which could then be detrimental to the entire party. And so there has to be a level of trust between members of a group to work together towards the group interests in order to see a successful outcome in something like the prisoner's dilemma. And that leads us to our final topic today, which is love and relationships. What leads to those intimate lasting relationships that we have in our lives? Psychologists have always been very interested in looking at why people end up in close intimate relationships, both friendships and romantic relationships with others. What are the factors that allow us to find these other people that we spend quality time with in our lives? One factor psychologists look at is proximity, which is essentially just looking at how close we are to other people in terms of physical location that leads to us forming those relationships. This makes sense and it's very natural that we do find relationships with people who are close to us. People we go to the same school with, people who live in the same town as us, in the same community, in the same state, we are more likely to come into contact with and more likely to form a friendship with. Now, of course, this is changing a little bit as we move into our modern society with the emergence of technology. It's very possible to form relationships and friendships with people who are not in the same location. But traditionally speaking, proximity does play a large role in the formation of the friendships and relationships that we have. Another factor that psychologists look at is physical appearance. Because the reality is, first impressions are often based on looks. But what we define as physical attractiveness can vary. It can be culturally based, and we can also experience things like mere exposure effects, as we learned about earlier in this unit, that the more we see something, the more we grow fond of it. So those first impressions are not the only way we develop physical attractiveness. But what we define as physically attractive is also perpetuated by society and what society deems as being attractive and unattractive. Think about TV shows and movies for an example. Films with heroes and villains often tap into physical attractiveness to say other things about a person's character. The hero is both good and often more physically attractive than the villain. And so this becomes a ingrained message in society that those who look better are also good. We know that this is not the case, but something that we should be cautious about when using physical attractiveness as a measure for relationships. And the final element that psychologists look at is similarity, which tells us we often find people who are like us. 
the people who share our values or our interests are more likely to be long-term lasting relationships. When we have something in common with the other person, it forms the basis for a strong relationship. And so these factors can lead us to find those friendships and those relationships that can lead to romantic relationships that can lead to love. And love often leads to what psychologists call self-disclosure, meaning we reveal things about ourselves, our secrets to other people that we would not share with the general public. And the ultimate goal, according to Robert Sternberg and his triangle theory of love, is to find what is known as consummate love. And this is what he refers to as the ideal love. It's a combination of passion, commitment, and intimacy that together create the ideal relationship for romantic love, which we often find through proximity, attractiveness, and similarity. So that's where we're gonna go ahead and stop for today and where we will wrap up social psychology. By now we've looked at a lot of different environmental factors that lead to why we think and act the way that we do. Hopefully this gives you a better idea of how the social situation can contribute to the behaviors that we see and prevent us from falling into the fundamental attribution error where we overestimate personal qualities and underestimate those situational forces. That's what's really at the heart of social psychology. I hope you found this useful and interesting as you take it into your everyday life. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, remember, be kind to your mind.